war in the South Atlantic. 41 days of fighting that proved the Harrier. War in which one nuclear-powered submarine held an entire Navy at bay. A limited war fought under unique conditions by two sides unprepared for it. A war fought by Argentinian pilots untrained for attacking ships. A land war fought largely at night. A war of indelible night images. A war finally won by the British ability to force march over difficult terrain and by their superior infantry tactics. Argentina had long claimed the Falkland Islands and believed Britain too far away to prevent an invasion. Also at stake was possession of important areas in mineral-rich Antarctica. And Britain developed the longest supply lines of any war to retake the islands. April the 2nd, 1982, an Argentinian flag flies over the Falkland Islands. Argentinian Marines in their Amtrak amphibious vehicles begin the confrontation that brought the first war between so-called Western nations for 40 years. Operativo Azul, Operation Blue, was named for the sea, the sky, and the robe of the Virgin Mary, guardian spirit of the Argentinian forces. The invaders arrived believing they were liberating the Falklands from colonial rule. Local reactions indicated otherwise. Originally, they planned to withdraw straight away, hoping simply to generate sympathy for their long-standing claim on the islands. But domestic need for a triumph of arms decided them to stay. Replacements arrived in a seemingly endless succession of Hercules and Air Force Boeing 707s. Ex-brigade from Buenos Aires province, well-equipped but comprising thousands of Chicos, the boy conscripts who served a year's compulsory national service. With them, the first Argentinian command muddle. Three brigadier generals now vied for control. They also brought in squadrons of the deadly Pucará ground attack planes that had proved so successful in counter-insurgency roles. Tanks never featured in the eventual defense of Port Stanley. It would be a key to Argentinian tactics that their experience was as a politicized anti-terrorism force, unused to facing a professional army trained to NATO standards. Sure that Britain would do nothing, the Argentinians now withdrew the crack marines who spearheaded the invasion. The desolate Falklands dependency of South Georgia. This is where forces came together to make conflict inevitable. Britain's Antarctic support ship Endurance was due for withdrawal leaving the island unprotected. Here at the deserted town of Leith, an Argentinian scrap metal dealer had won a contract to dismantle four disused whaling stations. Trouble began when the men were joined by a squad of Argentinian marines. Argentina, which had wanted to delay invasion until the southern winter, felt forced to bring it forward when Britain demanded withdrawal. Within a few days, Argentinian reinforcements arrived and raised their flag. The ensuing conflict brought two quite different military commanders face to face. General Galtieri had been president for three months, but faced mounting domestic protest over 100% inflation and falling wages. A man of action rather than foresight, he hatched a plan to seize the Falklands to divert public attention, believing Britain was no longer interested in defending them. Nonetheless, he was a soldier's soldier, commanding great loyalty from his troops. Admiral Sir John Fieldhouse was Britain's overall commander, but because he ran the distant battlefields from a control room in a London suburb, he got little credit at the time for being a clear-thinking strategist. Also, his extensive combat experience in World War II enabled him to steady jittery politicians during battlefield reverses. Admiral Fieldhouse's old ship, HMS Hermes, spearheads British Task Group 318 to regain the Falklands. 
designed to carry to battle the Royal Marine Commando Brigade with their necessary assault helicopters, she was packed with seven extra Sea Harriers and a squadron of anti-submarine Sea King helicopters. Most of the brigade would follow in the cruise liner Canberra. Somber crowds bade farewell as behind followed the more modern cruiser carrier HMS Invincible. Instead of five Sea Harriers, she now carried eight, but the task group's 20 Sea Harriers would be outnumbered 10 to 1 by the Argentinian Air Force. A makeshift naval force boosted by the secret departure from Gibraltar of nine warships from a NATO exercise. They included three modern T-42 destroyers. Two HMS Sheffield and HMS Coventry would not return. HMS Plymouth would be at battle in just over three weeks. Three other frigates included the more modern HMS Arrow, whose sister ships Antelope and Ardent would be sunk by Argentinian bombs. HMS Antrim would join Plymouth in retaking South Georgia while sister ship HMS Glamorgan would withstand a land-based Exocet missile attack. Altogether, 52 seamen would die in these ships. Sir Galahad left Britain next day, her name now synonymous with the task force's worst disaster. The amphibious landing ship, HMS Fearless, would spearhead the assault on the beaches of San Carlos. The North Sea Ferry, Norland, carried the 2nd Parachute Battalion to its decisive battles on the Falklands. And with considerably more pomp, Canberra sailed with the 3rd Commando Brigade. At sea, the techniques of battle were honed, a flare hunted by a sidewinder missile. These would be a major success of the war, downing more Argentinian aircraft than any other ordnance. The Harriers practiced the ground support that would turn future land battles. Deadliest of all, the cluster bomb. It broke Argentinian resistance at Goose Green. Just one company of Marines sailed with Hermes, their practice runs serving propaganda purposes as much as sharpening skills. used up 37 years of practice rounds preparing for combat, anti-tank rockets would be devastating trench clearance weapons. We probably have to face uh, the Air Force, and I don't know how much they will wish to use of it. I'm actually pretty confident that we've got jolly good systems for dealing with it, and this is no sort of puff. Um, we actually have some very good weapon systems and sensors in the force, and uh, some jolly good aircraft, uh, missile systems, all that sort of thing, which is well able to deal with that. It's been designed to do it. I think it's pretty good. I think they'd be very ill-advised to try and take us on, because they'll suffer some very severe losses. Uh, I would put our chances as being considerably better than the opposition's. Task Group Commander Sandy Woodward he'd later describe the conflict as a close-run thing. Ascension Island in mid-Atlantic, halfway to the Falklands and the vital staging post for supply and resupply. This was where the 100 ships of the task force could swap hastily loaded stores.
more poured into the huge airbase leased from Britain by the Americans, a staging post now becoming the world's busiest airport. War's longest ever supply line would run efficiently throughout the conflict. Regrouping and diplomatic attempts to prevent war kept some ships there for many days, but meanwhile, the spearhead group headed south. Britain now imposed a total exclusion zone to deter Argentinian reinforcements and launched Operation Paraquet to retake South Georgia and increase pressure on the Argentinians to withdraw. The battle group heads deeper into the South Atlantic, now one of three formations comprising 13 warships and four supply ships. Alongside Hermes, her watchdog, the frigate Broadsword, with its sophisticated Seawolf anti-air attack missiles. The heavy destroyer HMS Antrim had already been detached, destination South Georgia. There, a barrage from HMS Plymouth, aimed into surrounding hills, ensured Argentinian surrender without a fight. But not before the SAS had suffered a near disaster, crashing two helicopters in a dangerous landing behind Argentinian positions. The Argentinian submarine Santa Fe had landed 40 marines as reinforcements before being disabled by British helicopters and beached at Gritviken. When Royal Marines landed, the Argentinians surrendered without a shot being fired. The British had regained South Georgia just 22 days after the Argentinians captured it. The first action of a war 7,000 miles from home had ended with 190 Argentinians taken prisoner, including the 38 scrap metal workers who started it all. As the spearhead of the British task group entered the total exclusion zone, the Argentinian Navy was detected in what appeared to be a three-pronged attack. To neutralize this threat, the nuclear-powered submarine Conqueror was ordered to attack the Argentinian cruiser Belgrano, considered the closest danger. Massed Argentinian air attacks provided the wall's only air-to-air -air combat. More effective was the air-launched Exocet missile attack against the task group's radar picket ship HMS Sheffield. The battle group entered the total exclusion zone on May Day. Sea Harriers prepare for their first combat.